Hi everybody. So last talk before lunch. Now let's speed up a little bit. My name is Eve. I'm, Eve. I'm founder and managing partner of the Python Quants and also of the AI machine, our new company. And I will talk a little bit more about the practical aspects of getting such strategies up and running. It will be all about dynamic strategies as well, but more how I, maybe as a retail trader, can deploy such strategies. Because from experience, we've been doing training since years now, running events, like for example with CQF Institute uh, over the course of this week, where we try to teach people Python techniques for algorithmic trading. So starting from the basic financial data science, going over the strategies to the point of deployment. But what we notice is that actually the deployment part is the hard part. Many people talk about all day about strategies and what they can do with machine learning. But to put it into practice is actually what is the more difficult part, obviously. So I have a prepared the slide deck, but I also want to give you a live demo. I hope this all works with the internet available. Um, I might be skipping over a couple of the slides. You have access to my slide deck. I've just tweeted about it. So if you go to my Twitter handle DYGH, there you find the link. Um, it's hosted on my personal page, hilpish.com slash UI underscore tame dot PDF. And there you have access to my complete slide deck. Just a few words on what we do. Um, yeah, we are completely finance oriented. My PhD is in math finance. I've been working my whole life in the financial industry. And uh, over the last couple of years, it was almost exclusively on the tech side. And these days, it's uh, about finance, as we call it, where AI suddenly appears in the financial field. Um, so this is what's driving us, uh, Python Quants, our major company but we have uh, a few more legal entities, at least up and running. The one I'm going to talk about is the AI machine. What is uh, the Python quants doing? Uh, it's all centered actually around Python for finance. So we do trainings, events, we provide services to hedge funds, to brokers, We're working for example with Deutsche Börse in Germany for a couple of years. Um, I've written a couple of books. We have open source Python libraries. So it's quite a bunch of topics, but it's all centered around Python for finance. And these days, more and more about algo trading and, as I said before, artificial intelligence. The AI machine, one of our bigger internal projects, um, I will talk about this in detail uh, during this talk. But myself, if you're interested in not actually personal information, but about what I'm doing, what I'm talking about around the world, uh, this is the place to go. So you find, I think, resources for more than 100 of talks about Python for Finance, algo trading, like... YouTube videos, uh, gists, uh, GitHub repos, I don't know, for example, recent ODSC conference in London, I post regularly my stuff there. So it's, again, more about Python for Finance than about myself. These are my books. Actually, two of them are in the house, so on the wireless stand. I discovered both of them, the left and the right one. But I must say the best-selling one is the middle one. This is coming out hopefully before Christmas in print as the second edition. It's a major upgrade. Uh, many things have happened since 2014, December, when the first edition came out. So eagerly looking forward to it. The last thing I have to do is to write the preface. So it's not that much on my end anymore. It's then in the hands of O'Reilly. Data true and finance. Um, just a quick recap. What is driving our industry from my point of view? Of course, uh, we all... Every once in a while, I read the newspapers when I board the airplane. This is what I first do, of course. I pick Financial Times on my way. For example, this Monday on uh, my flight from Luxembourg to London, I picked up the Financial Times and I read it. But usually, I have like online access on my iPhone, on the iPad or whatnot. So it's all becoming electronic. And I would say that I think just a few decisions, if at all, are these days made based on what people read in the newspapers. Of course, all the people involved in trading, investing, portfolio management, you name it, in any kind of investment capacity have access to terminals. Here you see uh, Thomas Reuters, or these days, Refinitiv icon in the browser. And of course, it's a much more efficient way if you want to drill down and, for example, get all the details about Apple stock or whatever you're looking for. But even this is not driving that many um, decisions anymore in the markets. It's rather the programmatic access that you have. And if you want to Example, for do something with thick data, nobody wants to read through thousands of lines of thick data. 
So for currency payers, for example, you get like 2 million ticks per week. Uh, who wants to read that or to print it? Or like, you know, I don't know, the machine doesn't care if it's 200, 2,000, 2 million data points or even 200 million data points. This is what the machines are good at, processing these amounts of data. And here in Python, with the icon wrapper, you get you know, that stuff in a single line of code. And then you can put the power of Python with all the packages we have heard, for example, from Said about a couple of them um, in action. But it's not only the structured data where the machines are, of course, pretty good. We know all this. But it's also the unstructured data. And recently, we have been working uh, quite a bit. I said that we provide services, uh, companies. So I'm working with uh, Thomas Reuters Refinitiv. We've been working with Dow Jones <laughs> on text and news processing. We also heard about sentiment analysis, stuff that we have also been doing. And the machines are getting better and better at reading news. So when you see that roughly 1.5 million news articles are published per day, <laughs> Who should read that? Even if you can drill it down by some means to what is of interest to you or your trading universe, it's, it's hardly possible to come up with a kind of uh, a proper overview. But the machine, again, doesn't care if it's reading like 1,000 articles or 2,000 or provides you with summaries or uh, there was a question with regard to what do you do with regard to similar articles. They're, they're all, all these techniques are available to sort out what is pretty similar, to what extent the texts are similar and so forth. So you can really drill down maybe to what is uh, of real interest to you, what you would consider a signal instead of noise. And uh, again, the machines, it's easily scalable. They can do it. The programmatic APIs are available. You see it here, single line of Python code once again, and you have access to the data. And then you apply, again, what we've seen, like Beautiful Soup and whatnot, NLTK or Stanford OpenAI to come up with some insights out of the unstructured data. So the big investors like Two Sigma in New York, also one of our training clients, uh, they are kind of keen of getting their hands on uh, alternative data and investing millions and millions in data companies. Like here, see the example of regard to Enigma, like 95 million have been uh, invested in this one data company. Of course, everybody tries to get some advantage in the form of alternative data sources. And if they can get directly their hands on, um, this is what uh, then they hope will give them some advantage. because. The investable universe probably is kind of overanalyzed, so it's it's difficult to come up these days based on uh, standard techniques, based on standard data, to kind of like the big alpha. Some people say, well, we used to have uh, big alphas. To stay. Today is actually uh, still in existence, alpha, but it's not maybe like the low-hanging fruit where you can pick it up. The Python ecosystem is well suited to to really process that. Even the basic packages that almost everybody's using. Uh, for whatever task in data science, uh, they are already so powerful that it can do quite a lot. So when I think back when I was uh, at the university, when I did my PhD, oh my goodness, this was from today it feels like Stone Age. And if today somebody is studying financial engineering, quant finance, is interested in algo trading, even a student can get up and running, let's say within hours, and can get started processing large amounts of data, open data, free data, and even can get started trading. AI first finance, I think this is the next wave. The data driven finance is kind of like the basis. You need big data in order to apply properly machine learning algorithms. We have now the data available. We have it available in programmatic fashion. And now we are getting to AI. Also a book that you see on the outside um, at the Wiley uh, booth. It's one of the few books that really focuses on machine learning from a financial perspective. Because some things are simply different to what other people are using machine learning for. Um, and uh, there are a couple of uh, quotes that I, that I like out of the book, but there's, there's more to say about it. Um, maybe the last one is worth pointing out, like econometrics, econometrics might be good enough to succeed in financial academia for now, but succeeding in practice requires ML. So maybe there's something to it. Um, I must confess, although I'm kind of concerned and, and, and busy with all these topics all day, I don't know how far some people have gotten. I know many... Uh, in particular, the big hedge funds, they have the budgets, they have invested heavily in teams, have invested heavily in technology. But as far as I can tell from a couple of meetings I've had in this regard, it's, it's all kind of like at the beginning and not at the core. So when Google says we are AI first company, uh, most of the institutions in our markets are far away from being AI first financial institutions. What I mean by AI first finance is the following. So of course, we have financial markets and access here my my placeholder of all the data. X is, of course, growing over time exponentially. We're getting more and more data, not in the world at all, but 
also in the financial markets. And the markets are still kind of like the real-time processing um, engines there in different places around the world in different forms. They process the data in real-time and come up with some why. So we have inputs and then we have outputs, for example, in the form of prices, let's say. In markets' eyes, we know nonlinear, complex, changing. In history, finance, so when I studied finance in my PhD, I was really fascinated by the elegant theories. You know, you pick up, I don't know, a Copeland Weston uh, book or whatever is uh, kind of like an intro book. I say, well, this is so elegant. This whole world can be described in a single equation. I don't know, Cap M and, and whatever uh, you find there. They are simple and elegant theories, but when you then have a look at the empirical evidence, it's hardly any supporting evidence that you can find for most of the nice theories. So you know, this is a little bit of finance history, brain-driven, some genius professors came up with some nice looking equations. Uh, then afterwards, the other people tried to test it in the market and said, well, nice three doesn't really work that well. I must say my focus has been on the derivative side, so quant finance, EQF, uh, so to say. And there we have, I think, uh, a few more success stories even from the older days. But AI first in, fin uh, AI in finance or AI first finance, we change it a little bit. We get back to the scientific method. We have data-driven elements now, we have programmatic access, and we can apply models that might not be as concise, as nice, they might not be uh, written down on a single line, um, but they are general parametrizable trainable algorithms um, that can be applied to the large data sets. So we have both together. Maybe we, we borrow, of course, these algorithms from other fields, like um, Google Open Sources <laughs> TensorFlow, which is used to build self-driving cars. We can apply this to financial data as well. And uh, maybe people can come up with some good results, but they might be somehow functioning like a black box. You know? So this is what people then say, well, I don't know. And from a compliance perspective, we had this discussion over the week as well briefly in the, in the For Python Cons Bootcamp. Uh, what do uh, regulators say? What about compliance? How can they complain what's going on? And I'm pretty sure this will be an important um, discussion in the future. But I think that's where it's going to data-driven AI-first finance, and uh, this will, from my point of view, be there to stay. Of course, you need some other libraries like scikit-learn, TensorFlow, it's all there, and in particular, you probably need there also a different hardware infrastructure in order to speed things up, but this is all available. This is uh, where we in the finance industry are picking up things that have been more or less solved and are provided in other fields, so uh, we don't need to take too much care in this regard. Now getting to algo trading, what does it mean in terms of like trading, applying all this to the trading process? A simplified view of how I see the algorithmic trading uh, value chain, and this is also what we basically teach on a fundamental level to our students in the online certificate program and so forth. Um, on the left-hand side, it all starts with data, for sure. Maybe let's say you want to trade FX, your yesterday exchange rate. This will be my uh, example. Uh, one minute bars, and maybe August, September 2018. So that's, that's the data. Then you get started when you do a machine learning AI based approach. You say, well, let's come up with some time series features. Let's mix in economic indicators. Let's target, this will be the labels like directional movement, just a directional strategy. And then you apply your algorithms, and there are quite a few of them available. So Paul Vector Machine, DNA, and Classified, these are all examples, just like, you know, you do training, testing, cross validation. All these things, sequential train test splits, randomized temp uh, train test splits, and all these things. So next is that you vectorize that in terms of backtesting. You say, what, what are the economic results? The one thing is accuracy scores or hit ratios, which are, of course, interesting, but you want to see like the economic impact of your strategy. Then you apply maybe more sophisticated backtesting methods like event-based, where you say, well, now let's get a little bit more closer to what the markets are about and, and mix in microstructure elements, transaction costs, and and stop losses, take profits, and whatnot. And you want to visualize all that. And then there comes the hard part, the right-hand side, deployment. You need to transform your back-tested strategy into something that works in real-time online. And you need to deploy it in the cloud. This is what we even teach our students. And we say, well, uh, you shouldn't run any kind of trading strategy from your notebook back home. There are some good reasons and uh, to do it in the cloud. And there are not too many against the cloud deployment. Because you can get started with five years start of a month, and you have a proper professional infrastructure ready. And then you need to monitor and risk manage. So this is, in my simplified terms, the value chain. And hopefully there is something in it in terms of benefiting over time and doing better than the average day trader uh, in the markets. Python, 
basically covers all the uh, elements there. On the left hand side, of course, data must be come from some places, you know, it might be coming from trading platforms like FXCM or Runda for retail traders or from the professional providers like Thomas Reuters or Deep Stables Infinitive, Dow Jones, and then you have the whole value chain that you can apply to what you want to do there. And on the right hand side, you have then again the partners where you deploy it. So it starts typically with for a retail trader with the data platform or the, the, the trading platform for which you get the data and you deploy it and then you run your strategies on these platforms. In between, Python can take care of everything. Just a, this morning I answered an email, and for trading you really use Python as well? I said, yes, why not? Give me one reason why we shouldn't use Python to implement this whole thing. This was basically, I would say, my record uh, at, at um, ODSC. Recently in September in London with some hundred plus people that we had, I had 90 minutes and I tried not to get all the hundred through the process from A to Z, but uh, maybe some 20 reached the goal that we started out. People had signed up for an account and in the end people were trading a simple strategy based on an ML based algorithm. This is how far we've come. So almost everybody showing up with a notebook having internet access um, is basically able within if they are professional coders within minutes, I would say, uh, if you need to take some more hurdles, maybe within hours to get up and running. So this is just to say how far we have come, even in the retail space, what has been traditionally the domain of the biggest institutions in the markets, right? And on the other hand, when you have a look at what skills are required, data analysis, engineering skills, financial skills, backtesting skills, they need to write code, and then the deployment part comes, and it's kind of like the worst field. And when you have a look at the big financial institutions, be it within a bank, be it within a hedge fund asset manager, of course you have people, teams, complete departments for all the single aspects that you see there. But maybe some people can cover all the bases there. <coughs> and what the AI machine is about, this was basically my, my first idea, is that on the left hand side, the first four, these skills are basically pretty similar. So a good data scientist, financial engineer, quant analyst, Python coder can master like data features, machine learning, backtesting. They can do research, interactive financial analytics. They write a few hundred lines of code. But then the point comes where you say, well, now, how do I get this into deployment? And that's kind of the big thing, the big hurdle, which I call the deployment gap or last my problem. And uh, recently when I listened to a talk by Dr. Jessica Stout from Quantopian, she's managing director, I don't know, I go trading research or strategy research. She said they analyzed 100,000 of lines of code from Quantopian users there. Um, in terms of like thousands of algorithms. And what she said is kind of like the average algorithm has some 200 to maybe 300 lines of code. But this is what people can come up with. And probably there's some value in this crowdsourced thing. But when you then speak to people that properly deploy code. Just recently spoke to somebody from uh, Refinitiv, Tom Reuters, said, well, if my code is 150 lines long, it's, uh, it's an arbitrage-based cryptocurrency strategy, but my deployment code is 25,000 lines of code. So 150 to 25,000 lines of code. And this alone signifies not kind of like a matter of resources and a matter of, uh, of uh, time. It's also, I guess, probably a matter of skill. So now to the AI machine. A machine should cover everything in the middle, basically in a standardized fashion. So the rest, of course, we need data, we need execution platforms, but the AI machine is what uh, should uh, standardize to some extent and industrialize uh, what all the other uh, elements of this value chain are. So we have basically two things that we need to take care of. The one thing is that we take care of the prediction. We, we don't really care, actually, we support like technical rules, like SMA-based strategies or EWMA, what, what we have seen and heard about before, or statistical methods based on whatever regression, machine learning stuff based maybe on support vector machine, prediction-based or level-based, deep learning. It's all supported by the AI machine, but what is kind of like equally important is that you have decision rules and money management rules about that. So entry rules, stop loss, training stop loss, dynamic stop loss, take profit, position size, and capital allocation, and so forth. So this is the second side of the coin that's important, and we try to support um, both of them properly. Uh, Left-hand side, frankly, is a little bit easier than the right-hand side. So you might think, oh, well, this machine learning, but this is all standardized. This is all there, actually. 
a quick run through the value chains so that you have seen it once and then I show it live. We allow for Python and template based strategy definition with regard to the prediction engines that we support. We then provide standardized in and out sample backtesting, um, which is not meant to be a backtesting platform. This is just like I, I call this confirmatory backtest. So you should have done your research beforehand, but we support that. And then this the main part this is the deployment. With a single click, basically, you say, well, this is my strategy, these are the backtesting results, and you click on go live and it is deployed immediately. This is what we have uh, been after from the outset. Basically, what we try to do is see here, we try to cover the whole strategy lifecycle with all the signals and taking care of all the statistics. Here's a take profit, a loss, uh, a, a long position, a stop loss. When you have a look at the trading apps, they, they just focus on a single trade. Trade is open, what are kind of like open orders, like a stop loss or take profit. This is what you can see, but such a trading platform or such a trading app generally does not really know kind of what like you know the strategy is and that these hundred trades are like together one strategy life cycle for strategy X Y Z. In that sense just a quick demo but just to get it clear I was indicated 10 minutes but I was told that it's until 10 past 1 right? I do my best I do my best so so what do you typically do when we've heard about a couple of dynamic strategies? And this is now an example that I've been using uh, during the bootcamp actually as an exercise where I first introduced another strategy, but it's that simple that my hope is that we can focus on the, on the major elements of the, of the process and the value engine. So this is a Python Jupyter notebook, and I just do a quick run through. The, the graphics are probably the important parts. Um, here I work with Oanda. This is now what we have, uh, what we integrated with. I connect to the API, and for example, for me with a German account, I have access to a universe of some 120 instruments that I can trade there. I focus on FX here. Euro yes dollar. My account has a leverage of 20. I retrieve data history just for one day. This is the uh, this is for the 14th. So this week, current example. And it's one minute bar data, similar to what I've outlined in my overview of the process. We get some 1,429 one minute bars. And when you have an account with Rwanda, even a paper trading account, you get this data for free. So uh, I'm not paying any kind of data license or whatnot. These integrated systems have the advantage that you get that data. So momentum-based strategy, um, it's a pretty simple time series momentum approach where I just rely on returns. And I say, here yeah, I calculate the returns and I say, when the average of the last six returns is positive, I want to go long. And when it's negative, I want to go short. If this makes sense, it's not my business here today to argue or not. Um, I wouldn't recommend to trade that, but it's simple enough, I guess, that we all see what's going on. Here is the strategy formulation. So if uh, my momentum parameter, my signal, is positive, I go long and here I go short. This can now, based on decisions, can be made as complicated as you like. You know? But this is simple, straightforward. We can have a look at the hit ratio. Here, um, it's, uh, I think, all but good. We just have a hit ratio of 47.1. So we'll say, oh, well, this is even worse than tossing the coin. Yeah, but th the question, Marcus, with, the, with regard to the hit ratio is that uh, do we get the right moves right? So we want to get the big moves right, not just like all the moves right. So it's just one side of the coin. So let's do some vectorized backtesting here. A little bit of technique. You see Python, just a few lines of code. And uh, here is my picture. And you see <laughs> without transaction costs on the very simplified assumptions, you see here I have a stellar performance. Not that much, but it's just one trading day. And if you have a leverage of 20, this would be kind of exceptional, right? Um, I must say, of course, I have deliberately chosen this time window to show you some good performance. <laughs> uh, of course, I mean, but it's a, it's a current one, and sometimes these strategy work pretty well, as we see, but there are other times, and enough other times, where it doesn't work pretty well. So this is what people can do, kind of like, with a little bit of experience. So they derive the strategy. We have quite a few of trades over the course of the day, so it's intraday algorithmic uh, trading. Um, and we say, well, now, so what? 
that is the question. Now, so what? How, how do I get this now deployed in the markets? How do I get it up and running? How, if I believe in a strategy, can I make money out of that? Uh, I can come up with 10 more, but the question remains, you know, how can I do it? And this is what the iMachine is supposed to solve, um, actually. So I have formulae so that I don't need to type that much. I'm now in the AI machine, and you see on the AI machine, I maybe increase this a little bit so that yeah, I can, it's better, right? Not even, it uh, should be. So this is now Jupyter Notebook within the AI machine where you have a template-based strategy definition. Here's a Python class we inherit from our standard strategy class. And if you know the rules, and there are not too many, you can now exactly model the strategy. We say, well, instrument is by default euro yes dollar, but can be any other thing. Frequency is one minute by default, can be any other thing. So the defaults are now exactly what I've been testing. Momentum is six minutes in that sense. Uh, proportional transaction costs, I have defined here testing start and testing end are now set. These are now exactly the parameters that I've been using in my Jupyter notebook. Just a few. So you know them, you have seen the performance. There's the rest of this uh, little class um, is just about the um, data creation itself and about the rule. So this is basically the same Python code, you know, that we've seen before, before with a couple of conventions. Of course, it's a class context, so it's quite a bunch of cells here, and the naming conventions need to be known as well. But the code itself, the logic, how you do it, it's exactly the same thing. And now we have kind of the combination of backtesting and trading. So we have integrated this. We have this now, this thing, and I say, well, I haven't changed anything, so I don't need to upload it. Otherwise, I would say save and upload. Uploading mean make it available to the other instances. And uh, here I might, uh, this doesn't need to be that much zoomed in. I have done a backtest here. Is that the right one? The numbers don't seem to be a good one. Let me simply redo a backtest. The backtest is the fastest one here, the fastest element. So when I click on plus, it says backtest model. Momstrad is the first that is given here. Every minute, six. So you see exactly kind of like my parameters from the Jupyter Notebook. So I could change. I've just currently here in this account two strategies, but here you see <laughs> the bunch of instruments that I have available as a retail trader, as an wonder. Client, and here are kind of like the uh, time intervals of frequency that is supported. But I want to stick with exactly what I what I had before, right? So um, as simple as that. When I say backtest model, and if this works backend, you just saw in progress. Now it's completed, and now we get what I was looking for. So here, oops. Sorry. Um, we see now there the interactive graphic, and this looks pretty similar. So let me get to the end here. It says something like 1.01 performance, and I think in my notebook it was slightly different. Maybe the data is um, differently received. So 1.01, and here it's also 1.01 something. So this is somehow similar. It's just a completely different scaling because the other... It's a different scaling, therefore the, uh, the charts are not like um, exactly the same. But you have the back test, and with this simple strategy, we don't have really any in-sample, out-sample. For all the machine learning based uh, things we have implemented in with this out-sampling. They would say, well, this is my training period, this is my test period, but again, not in intended to be a back testing platform, it's just confirmatory. They would say, well, basically I can here uh, make sure that what I have done in research is actually um, doing the same thing on the platform just as a as a confirmation that my transformation to the platform code has been correct in that sense. And we have this all over the industry. There are the quants actually doing the stuff, and then you have the people that are supposed to put stuff into production. And um, there's often kind of like uh, enough potential for uh, error, let's say. Last but not least, um, when I close this, let me quickly close it. I have two things running here. The one is a, what is it? A Euro US dollar based strategy. That's mine. My simple thing. And there's some other thing running, which is currently losing money. This has also lost some money. I started this like, I don't know, two hours before, because otherwise we wouldn't see that much. But now you saw 
my research, my short to be done notebook, how I formulated the same strategy as a template. The next thing was a confirmatory backtest and afterwards I click go live. Maybe I can show you uh, so that you have seen this as well. When I have backtested this, I can click on go live and the only thing that I need to specify is here the quantity to trade, some losses, some stake profit, the leverage uh, that is current, number of bars to total this uh, relates only to stop loss. So I can use them or not, uh, but this relates to uh, trading stop loss into this program. And then I click add model and instantly it is deployed. So getting back to the uh, live models here, I'm going to now click on that one, this is quite a bit of data that is loaded. I can make this now a little bit larger. And here you go. And over the time, you see this is updating in real time. You see this has been trading now since a few hours. You know? Now I get the whole data in there. Quite a bunch of short, long, short, because we're just trading on six one minute bars. So the chance for a signal to change it's kind of quite often, you see it doesn't uh, work too well, but this was not my point. I would rather would like to have something where it is lots of action. So all these are short um, and long positions. You see every single signal that is generated. So this is a bit asked. This is the mid price on which the signals are based. And you see the triangles, if they are green, this means this was a right signal. If they are red, this means this was a wrong signal. So if all these wrong right signals and down there you have um, Strategies. When I go to the right hand end, let me maybe just go to 10 minutes. And on the right hand side, this you see this now moving correctly. And you also see when this is green, this means like the last move was with our strategy. So it was a good move for us. And this gets updated in real time, and we have it. So on the other hand, um, the same two positions are in the account shown here so we see now in the under trading account our two um, positions here indicated with p and l in real time so we don't try to replicate what the app does anyways we just try to manage the strategy life cycle with the multitude of trades there so this is what you can of course have like all the traders with four screens or eight screens or how many you can have all this open at the same time but here we have real time p and l shown real time signal um, Validation, the real-time positions, and everything is shown there. Also, in terms of uh, numbers, here like the uh, PNL is shown. Or when I go down, you can also export as a CSV file all the statistics that are, have been collected for this strategy. That much about the demo and about the process. Uh, about the one-click deployment of your Python-based algo strategy. What's next? What's up? Um, so we're currently working. This is a little bit of an outlook. It's work in progress, but we have done a proof of concept because what we've noticed is with regard to any strategy idea, we always have been doing the same stuff, like model fitting, model here, testing, blah, blah, blah. And you get kind of like the feeling that all this doing over and over again can be somehow automated. And then I discovered there is kind of a, a big good company out there called DataRaw, but they have automated this machine learning aspect. And this is their product, it's automated machine learning. And we have done kind of like a proof of concept that is working kind of well. And the sense of that this features and labels creation plus the machine and deep learning aspect is, so to say, completely already kind of covered by the data robot, like automated uh, features creation and training testing of machine. So they test like, let's say, 50 different algorithms on your problem, be it a time series prediction problem, a classification or estimation problem. And the wonderful thing about this is, and this is what brought me into this whole thing, is that they say, well, of, out of the 50, we have the top three of these statistics and we can drill down and so forth. And say, well, this seems to have good results. And then you click on a single button and you get an API from data <coughs> robot which you can hit with your features data and you get back, so to say, the signal. So this is what we can integrate to the AI machine. They say, well, instead of maybe this Python template Jupyter thing, we just have here like an API that we hit, we provide the data and we get back the signal based on what we have trained before. So the standardized deployment of AI-based algorithmic trading, uh, trading strategies then comes and really um, 
scalable on an industrial level. So that we say, well, we have data sources, of course. The data is something you need to curate, you need to come up with, you need to transform your data into the proper formats and so forth. Then feature analysis can be done by research. I think this is still a domain where people can provide the input properly. Although, for example, with regard to time series features, Data Robot gives you like 350 features from the outset. So you simply click on it and you get them. And then you can get started working and tweaking around. Then the strategies themselves, either manual model selection or automated ML via Data Robot. Actually, for me, not being an ML PhD or whatnot, I've discovered quite a bunch of interesting models there that I've never heard of before. Backtesting can be done by both platforms. Deployment, exactly the same via this API that we hit. We had like in a proof of concept, the first issue that we ran into was that the prediction took some 40 seconds for us to get back. Too, much, too long of a turnaround time. So it's just a little bit of tweaking. Uh, from their end, we got it down to some 800 milliseconds. And I said, there are many more low-hanging fruits. So latency, although we are not doing high-frequency trading, is a topic. Uh, if we can get it, let's say, to below half a second for our five-minute, ten-minute uh, intervals, this is kind of okay what we are trading. with. Deployment and then portfolio oversight by the AI machine. This is what I have as a vision. So end-to-end -end integration with trading platform. Template-based strategy definition. If you know Python, you can define your strategies there. Also, auto-derivation of AI-based trading strategies, live monitoring, audit for multiple strategies, and management of the strategy lifecycle. This is what the AI machine is all about. Thank you. <laughs> One minute for questions, given your time management instructions. <laughs> Do we have some, or everybody's too hungry <laughs> to get out there? Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, a, a quick question. Don't have they provided like one a or SCM can go and we just upload the function directly to their platform to do backtesting or trading? Not that I'm aware of. They provide kind of like one provides excellent. Uh, uh, API support, FXCM provides excellent AI support. They provide some algo strategy support as well, but not in a, in a way that you say, well, I, the Python quant and researcher, you know, can do my work exactly there. And on the other hand, you have these backtesting platforms like Quantopian, but they are missing then the link to say, go live. So there is no go live button. You know? 100,000 of strategies backtested, but 25 now actively traded. No, no, no. Uh, so, uh, what, what's, the, what's the limit that you have on the functions you can take from them? Well, actually, these are not platforms for high frequency trading. So, our turnaround times from uh, interval is full. So, say next interval, now we need to create the next signal, is roughly a fifth of a second, so like 200 milliseconds. It's okay for my purposes, like five minutes, 10 minutes. This is what we are focusing on. Um, maybe in the future also different forms of uh, bars, not like time-based bars, but rather tick bars or whatnot. But currently that's okay. So uh, I'm pretty sure when you get to uh, um, proper pro accounts, what they offer, you get... For example, with FXCM, they offer co-location. So you can run your analytics there co-located. But it's not our main focus currently. It's more the process, the workflow, the efficiency on this end. And also we measure, of course, slippage. You know, what, what is our signal price and what is the price at which we have executed. And this is also, for me, one of the arguments where I say, well, that's okay. A quick lunch. Enjoy the quick lunch. <laughs>